In this episode, we reviewed the Imprint Films Blu-ray release of Uptight, which was released in 1968. We also do a deep dive review on the film itself, which was directed by Jules Dassin. He co-wrote the screenplay with Ruby D uh, and Julian Mayfield. Ruby D and Julian Mayfield also star in the film alongside Raymond St. Jocks, Frank Silvera, and Roscoe Lee Brown. Welcome to Rubber Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a YouTube video podcast where we explore storytelling on film as well as interviews with industry professionals who work in film, television, theater, among other areas of the arts. I want to welcome back to the show film critic from In the Seats, Dave Voigt. Dave, welcome back. Thank you so much again for joining me. Oh, Rob, thanks for having me as always. You know, I love to talk movies. <laughs> I had a hunch. <laughs> <laughs> so we both got the uptight, there we go, Blu-ray from Imprint. Love that cover. So. What did you think of this release here, Dave? Well, I mean, as with everything with uh, with Imprint, I mean, again, it's just another fantastic release from uh, an Australian label, uh, you know, that is putting out some really fantastic stuff. If you're a physical media person and you want to look for some really hard to find gems, Imprint is putting out sort of gold pretty yeah. much each and every month. So, I mean, I cannot recommend them highly enough. But I mean, as far as uh, like the release or the film in general, just uh, this release uh, in terms of, you know, just looking at the special features, uh, which I thought were quite good. Film critic, writer, Christina New Newland on Uptight. That's about 16, 17 minutes. Uh, elective, uh, vis vicissitude. That's a hard word to say. The Radical Exiles of Jules Dassin. And I love Dassin, a video essay by film historian Daniel Kremer. And then we got an audio commentary by film historians Elaine Silver and Jim Ursini, and you got the 1080p high definition uh, presentation of a 2019 4K scan from the original camera negative by Paramount. So I thought the featurettes were quite good. Did you get a chance to check those out? I did. No, they they definitely were interesting. I had a lot of context as well, and I mean, speaking just from the from the transfer as well, Paramount does such a fantastic job on on maintaining and restoring their catalog for 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 licensing such like this and i mean it, i don't think this movie this movie probably hasn't looked this good since uh since its release in 68 it's it, it really does pop uh when you when you put it on and you, you and watch it it's a, uh, it's a it's uh it's a gorgeous well not gorgeous but i mean it's it's a it's a discernedly ugly piece of cinema but i mean it's very it like everything in it kind of pops and i mean it kind of yeah. speaks to just sort of Dessin's really style as well. And I mean, it's just, it's a great sort of unappreciated piece of work from his catalog, at least in my opinion, anyway. Yeah, I completely agree. And for me, not, I, you know, I don't want to, to, you know, put this into any kind of a category, but it, it's strong. It strongly has a neo-noir influence. I mean, even down to the story and the, the shooting style, I thought. And it reminded me so much of the neo-noirs that you saw in the 80s and 90s, where right. the only colors were like dark blue, black, a lot of night shooting, brown, uh, something like Angel Heart or Basic Instinct, uh, Cruising, uh, a lot of Abel Ferrara's films, you know, like King of uh, King of New York. I was like, this this must have been an influence on those on the neo-noir that would that would to come later because we have a combination of a documentary style only really at the beginning with the mlk which mm. it's incredible that is the real funeral martin yeah, luther king's yeah. funeral in this film this is by a major motion picture company paramount and they have it at the beginning of this film which is extraordinary so we have that which it you know it goes back to the naked city with Dassin, which he directed, and then we have this very stylized, expressionistic, st um, visual style. And you look at this Dassin, he made some, in my opinion, some of the best film noir movies. I mean, you can look at Brute Force, yeah, like totally. I said, The Naked City, Thieves Highway, yeah. uh, Rafifi, you know, uh, uh, 
Night in the City. Uh, you know, he's no stranger to <laughs> to film noir. So I was curious, did that did you were you looking at this and thinking, I'm seeing a real noir influence here? You know, a little bit, but also in many ways, at least when I was watching, because this had been the first time in probably about a decade that I had watched the film. I had seen it before, but when I got to rewatch this release, it really struck me as on one end. This was such a this was a bit of a forerunner for some of that golden era of 70s cinema that yeah. we got just in terms of style and, and visual aesthetic and look. But also in many ways, this was a forerunner for uh the black exploitation genre because I mean yeah. this this predates Melvin Van Peebles, this predates so many of those films and it's really such an interesting thing to watch because i mean when you really boil it down to blast brass tacks i mean this is 1968 it's a studio making a film about black revolutionaries directed by someone who was accused of being a communist it, it's kind of a maze that this film even got oh, made to begin with i know i know it's pretty incredible and dasin you know he this is he this is the first film he made coming back to America after being blacklisted. He lived in Greece and Europe and he comes back and he, I wonder if he just thought, what could they do to me at this point? I'm going to make the most <laughs> radical, <laughs> you know, film and then fuck off back to Greece. And which is what yeah. he did. He made this and, and, and he went back, he went back there because that's where his, his life was. And like I said, we have the MLK, funeral not only that we have black revolutionaries in the film criticizing mlk like you can imagine that this guy mm. had just died um and we have the funeral in there we have very much a part of the film the where the characters are now debating whether or not they need to to use violence to to create a revolution that the way that mlk was approaching things and non-violence doesn't work and so we have all these various opinions where people are saying no we can't get violent and then other revolutionaries say no we need to get violent and you can understand their anger when mlk one of the you know the 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 leader of the civil rights movement is assassinated not only that this is not in the film but i know on the featurettes they talked about it 68 you had uh rfk was assassinated you had those mm. riots at the the democratic um what was i forget what that the um what did they call the democratic the national convention i mean there was even a movie with that as well yes. with Axel west wexler's uh, cool. Movie yeah. cool. yes yes um and and so i'm not surprised that well in a way i'm surprised because it's a it's a studio film but i'm not surprised that we see something like this but that is pretty bold. And it makes me wonder, because I know that Christina Newland on the on the uh, featurette, she said that Dassin is the one shooting the funeral. So he went there, shot it, and then mm. the production started a few months later. So I imagine they just, on the spur of the moment, Dassin must have, whatever reason he felt to capture that funeral, they must have then made changes to the script to to because that is is very much a part of the beginning of everyone reacting to the death of of ml of uh martin luther king because well like it was said, such an interesting know. framework to use as well considering this was i mean arguably a remake of a of a john ford film as well just because it's, former, it's one right? of those things where we're really getting this fascinating and very culturally relevant story and i mean it's amazing to see this sort of now because as much as it is of that time it is still terribly relevant today oh, and I yeah. mean, there is one i mean it's it's a little awkward for two white guys to be discussing this film about black revolutionaries but we will put we will put that aside for just one second yeah and i mean there is a line from the film that really sticks out to me where where everyone's organized and it's someone says like just don't talk to me about dying. I'm a black man in America. I was born dead. Right, right. And I mean, that kind of idea of dealing with the relevance of the fact that just by being black in America could get them killed. Right. 
is something that you know guys like you and I will never understand. So, which is what makes it so powerful. Um, for people who haven't seen it, just to give a little, well, I may as well read the summary on the back here. Uh, so, like we've already said, it's the days after the assassination of Martin Luther King, an unemployed and a uh, steel worker turns over his militant friend to the police for the $1,000 reward, resulting in an underground all points bulletin to exact vengeance on the squealer. So, which was another thing that really appealed to me about this film is as much as it is political and the issues that we've already discussed that the characters are wrestling with, it is also really about this one man uh, tank played bri brilliantly by uh, Julian Mayfield, who, you know, again, I, I can't help but see the 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 noir. You know that this is is neo very neo noir and and the influence from film noir because he's a classic noir character. He's the doom protagonist. He's you know he's not tortured from the war, but he's tortured as a result of being an alcoholic. Uh, from you know simply the color of his skin and he's an outsider even amongst the revolutionaries because of the fact that he drinks heavily uh, and no one wants anything to do with him uh, you know Johnny is like boyhood friend after you know he kills the guard and everyone is mm. after him uh, there's this that great scene where he he meets Tank and tells Tank you know I'll try to get you back in with with the revolutionaries and and then right after that uh bg who strongly dislikes tank clearly that was a lie when he says oh you know yeah we already talked to johnny and he said cut tank loose we don't want anything to do with him so and again he's desperate he's broke uh and he's feeling rejected he's feeling alone he's isolated again very film noir and so he makes that that choice, this moral dilemma. Do I, you know, turn this guy in uh, or not? And he does, and he and he picks up the money and then totally self-destructs. You know, he's he uh, to me, I saw that as a death wish. I mean, he goes to the bar, he's buying drinks for everybody, and everyone knows he's broke. He goes to Johnny's house with gives the mother some money. I mean, it's highly suspicious um yeah. it's and of course you know at the end we we see him killed uh it's 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 very you know all all we're missing is a femme fatale not that every noir needs a femme fatale but <laughs> it's very uh noirish and i didn't really spot that because i saw this a few years ago never heard of it before i love dasson but i've never heard of it and barry jenkins on the criterion channel which they show uh, on one of the featurettes here. Yeah, uh, that's right. He, yeah. he was the one who, who uh, I guess he was in, he was one of the highlights of one of the month, the adventures in movie going, I believe. And this was one of his picks. And I was like, how do I not, not know this? Uh, but again, to me, you know, outside of the politics in the film and the, the, the race relations, to me, this truly about this guy tank. I mean, I was curious if that's, was something you uh had any, any thoughts on well i mean it resonated with me just because it's again he did co-write this with ruby d and and dasson yeah. and one of those things where when you have the right material in the right moment somebody sometimes somebody who is not an actor can deliver the kind of performance that you couldn't necessarily traditionally get from an actor you know what I mean? Like he he does such yeah, a good he's not job in anything else. with sort of the desperation of it all. Oh, he's brilliant! Like he's in one other film, Virgin Island. Yeah, uh, and that's it. Uh, and you know, they talked in the featurette that you know he was very much a part of the civil rights movement. He apparently even lived in Ghana and was the speechwriter for the president of Ghana. So he was a political activist. But it's a shame he didn't act more because I thought his performance was I thought it was stunning. You know, I just thought he was incredible, particularly that one scene where he goes, you know, I love this scene where he goes, you know, they, they were steel, they were like um, mine workers, at uh, coal mine workers, and he goes to where they worked, and, you know, he's he's telling, you know, like, shouting out that he, how he loves where he, the place of, of work, and that was like the good times for him, and it's so interesting to think that 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 this was his nostalgia when it was just him and his buddies working there 
uh, and you know, politically speaking, obviously, the, there were always these problems, and they were severe. Uh, being being black, where they where they are in Cleveland, Ohio, here. But I think for him, it was like, well, at least I had my friends, and now he doesn't have anybody. Yeah, you know, uh, I love I love that scene. I don't know if you had any thoughts on that moment. I thought that was such a powerful moment. Just of the, the the close ups, the framing, everything about that was beautiful. I thought. Well, I mean, again, it speaks to Dasson and just sort of his ability to get characters in their worst and i mean the material i mean sort of transposing you know the informer onto a story like this was so fascinating because again as it sort of all unraveled it, it, it kind of reminded me just of the importance of somebody like a ruby d who had been a, a, a you know a working actor and, and you know working and stuff like you know edge of the city and uh raisin in the sun but never really had had a chance to sort of do something significant you know like we've seen her do plenty of tv stuff up until then but this really felt like it was her breaking out of sort of that paint in place kind of mold and i mean i even wonder when i see something like this film would if not for this film, would somebody like a Sidney Poitier have been able to start directing something like Buck and the Preacher? Mm. How important was this movie to just really open up the industry to to giving us a variety uh, of of different uh, African American stories? Because right. again, this I like this was so of the time, and I mean, we were studio wise, independent wise we weren't seeing films like this all that often and it and it sort of bred so much more to come out of it like even with all the stuff that we see in the 70s like i mean i can even think to sort of uh you know the pacula triumvirate of, of political thrillers like parallax and then all the president's men and things like that so much of that energy does feel like it was born out of a film like uptight I totally agree. And I, I think that's a great point. And they mentioned, you know, again, this I thought the featurettes were great because they mentioned what we what we mainly saw mostly with, you know, black characters as the lead, like Sidney Potier was was him with reconciling, you know, it was with yeah. white with the white people. And here we do, there's not even an ounce of that. I mean, the one white liberal who was for like trying to support them. They tell him to get the fuck out. I mean, they throw him out. <laughs> Whereas, and that, I mean, even to see that in the late, I mean, even now when you see a few years ago, like Green Book winning Best Picture, it's still, yeah. I mean, I thought that was a good movie, but it is that, it's that thing that that most people are comfortable with. Like, let's get along. And that's, that's not really what's happening. I mean, <laughs> especially then, right? So to see this film where they tell this guy to get out, it's pretty bold. You know, I thought, no, no, there it is. And I mean, again, it's which is why I think this was so key for for developing sort of the the black exploitation cinema movement and stories, because I mean, again, there is a boldness in there that is necessary. Like, you know, even even if you try to take a, an Ozzy Davis directed movie like a like a Cotton Comes to Harlem, you know, there still has to be sort of that energy of, of quite frankly, not giving a fuck and just telling the story of the way yeah. they want to tell the story. Yeah. Yeah. And you can feel that here because we have uh, a man who, who, who was a communist as a director who was thrown out of the country. We have black re revolutionaries who were very involved in this film. Uh, not only that, the, I mean, the FBI was constantly watching them. I think, I, I don't think anyone cared what anyone thought. It was like, they were going to explore the truth of this because it was, it was necessary. But again, just having that funeral at the beginning to me again is so, and I thought Dassin captured faces, reactions of people who look totally lost and sad, but at the same time, like we saw, uh people openly in the film criticizing him thinking that he wasn't what he was saying wasn't good enough or uh, again i mean to think that this is right after he died um that it's it's shock it's shocking now i mean we don't you know people people 
mostly praised MLK. I mean, rightfully so, but you don't hear anyone today with those out of maybe, I mean, I watched another, listened to another podcast and someone was saying, well, people don't want to admit that that's how some people looked at him back then. And I thought, well, that's interesting, you know, that not everyone looked at him as a hero. No. And I mean, it's, it, it's so applicable. I mean, there, it's just one of those things where, Given sort of the political climate of the of of the you know the anti communist movement, which was just so prevalent and like born mm-hmm. out of sort of the aftermath of World War II, it, it it's fascinating to see just how this lines up with sort of who he was as an individual. This almost feels like, in many ways, one of the films that he wanted to make for himself. You know what I mean? As yeah. opposed to, uh, you know, maybe something like, uh, you know, uh, Top, uh, you know, what's like Top Cappy with, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. with his wife and Peter yeah. Ustinov. You know, I mean, which is a which is a great movie. Don't get me wrong, but it's right. totally. He's one of those directors where you're always kind of surprised how much he's mixing it up. Like you don't expect the person who made up tight to be someone who worked with sort of Burt Lancaster at the, at the height of his powers. You know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. I, I, I find he's, he's completely underappreciated filmmaker. I mean, I, I once was looking for a book on him and I found one, but it was pretty thin. It, there, it wasn't, it wasn't too, too involved. It was mostly photos. And I thought, I mean, obviously film noir people know him, but he's done so so much for some he's just one of these guys in a way has slipped through the cracks i mean he's appreciated yet not quite as known as some other you know major directors of the day would we have a high genre without rafifi i I argue that we may not yeah yeah that's a good point that's a good point but i just love it um i'll just take a look at the uh inside for people hopefully this isn't blurry again okay that's a little better (laughs) oh there we go you have to forgive the zoom settings for some reason (laughs) is making this blurry it's Uh, great photo art definitely yeah yeah no it is it is i mean i love their releases uh again to just when you see like the care that goes into these sleeves and these you know you just for me again it makes you want to follow the company it's like, okay, if they put this together with this much care, who are they? You know, and I, I know some of their other releases, like the Via Vision ones on the inside, they have uh, a bunch of photos of, of so many of their releases, which is great because it's like, I remember when I was, you know, much younger collecting physical media. I didn't necessarily, unless it was Criterion, I didn't always necessarily look at who was putting it out. Uh, but again, it's like, it's a good little nudge to say, you know, this is a label and we care about movies and and we're doing something special here but well um, and i mean it's so interesting too because i mean given the uproar that happened recently with everything going on uh, surrounding sort of tcm and just sort of right. the drama there it it it's yet another reminder that you know especially with so many of these classic films where i mean the reality is as much as you and i guys like you and i are watching old stuff watching new stuff and are sort of aware and have a certain degree of education, there's still tons of stuff that we've both missed. Like, oh, oh, abs- the universe absolutely. has not scratched the surface with the amount of actual movies that are out there. Oh, I know, I know. I mean, you know, this is such a a case in point today when w- w- there's so much that it gets released on streaming, and you got to figure how much gets lost, you know, or how much goes straight to VOD. Or how much stuff only gets a festival run. And it'll be interesting, you know, 30, 50 years from now, we may be saying that the 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 early 2020s were some of the great films, but no one knew it at the time. <laughs> Who knows, right? I mean, we're it's just we're so there's so it's easy to go, it's always easy to go back, right? Because then we're not we're looking at the best stuff, you know, and we have people, great scholars, writers, historians, you know like yourself who are who are writing about them and, and and so we're we're leading that path and finding things but it's always harder when things are happening i find i don't know if that's your experience just no i mean history. it is because uh 
you know, especially with newer stuff, there is that sort of impulse to be like, oh, well, it'll be streaming soon enough or it'll be on video on demand soon enough. Right. But it, on the on the flip side of that, when I see, and I mean, I had the chance of, of doing a podcast with uh, uh, some film programmers. They have a, a podcast of their own, of Movies and Chaos, uh, talk with you know people working at the Review Cinema here in Toronto. And I mean, there is such a care that is going on now with retrospective cinema mm. that we would only see in labels, home video labels like Imprint, like a Criterion, Kino Lorber, Arrow. Yeah, that is starting to bring people back to the theatrical experience, if only a little bit. Because yeah. I mean, again, it's we're really in an interesting time where, you know, you people are expecting these big blockbusters and the things to hold, but it's become almost a little too disposable. Yeah, and there is more of a call to people in the industry and people sort of in the know to at least sort of cognizantly sort of keep o- older cinema like this alive because I mean again it's so vital and it's so important that I mean I know I'm standing on a soapbox repeating myself right now but I mean it's so important just to oh, be able absolutely. to have access oh absolutely your films like this if only to learn from them going yeah. forward for people making films oh I completely agree so again thank God for boutique labels like like imprint um keeping these alive with great featurettes, which uh, also, like I said, are are very, very educational. I wanted to touch a little bit about on the character Clarence, played by Roscoe Lee Brown. Here's another, another step further. They go, I mean, it, it's one thing that he is a black man who wor- is working for police as an informant. But not only that, he's gay. He's openly gay. And I thought, wow, again, late 60s, <laughs> they they just went all out, you know. I mean, uh, I, I, on the one hand, you you know, it's, he's, you know, it's a gay man not being portrayed in a positive light, but which I can understand when gay people didn't have rights that you yeah they, they would want to see positive, you know, and especially in America, positive, um, portrayals but on the other hand it's it's just interesting that they they just pushed the envelope even further uh by not only making him uh black who's working for the police and informant but gay and not only that that first scene we see him in when they're all watching mlk's funeral on the tv he seems to be very much in control of the room i thought for you know for example he keeps using the n-word and right. you see the other cops are getting uncomfortable. One guy's like, oh, I didn't even think Martin Luther King was such a big deal. And he's like, well, you're just, you know, he calls him on it. He's like, you're saying that you're just racist, that you just say, you're just saying that because he's a black man. And how could a black man, how could anyone care so much that thousands of people show up at this funeral? Um, whether those police thought that or not is hard to say, but he at least is taking it that way. And they they shut their mouths around him, which I thought was interesting how he would almost seem like he was the boss and he, you know, keeps using the N word or, and, or the, the, the other homophobic slur, the F word, uh, keeps using these, you know, well, he says that only once, but again, the N word a few times and as a way to sort of remind them of what they think, or at least to make them as uncomfortable as possible, whether they, those people were racist or not, it's, you, you don't, you don't see them again, but right. I thought that was pretty extraordinary. I don't know what, what you thought of that. I thought of that character or that scene. Well, I mean, to me, it's one of those things where, again, I'm kind of reminded of just the realities of how we view what a studio movie is. Because, I mean, even, like, back then, anyone who made films, it was just, you know, it's it was different. We don't, like, they, nobody ever thought of the film studios as the corporations that they are now. You know what I mean? Right, right. Especially a place like Paramount, which was almost, almost akin to, you know, someone like an A24 these days doing sort of yeah. more subversive, more esoteric, even some more art-driven films yes. on top of the 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 grander sort of Cecil B. DeMille studio stuff at the same time. Yeah, that's true. That I mean, A24 is a fair 
comparison nowadays. I can't think of anyone else who's somewhat major. <laughs> like you're saying, it's, it's all corporate. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where, like, I'm not necessarily surprised by use of language or anything like that, just because given the situation that the characters were in, so it wasn't necessarily something that caught me off guard, but I mean, I think it's just the willingness to put it out there. And I mean, I think that's part of why, you know, you, Ruby D would you know get somebody like Dassin to do somebody like that do something like this because I can imagine perhaps if an actress like Ruby D who was established and, and wanted to sort of try to spearhead something a little more subversive and artistic tried to get somebody a little more mainstream to do this they may have balked mm. oh for sure oh for sure I think I think I would imagine they, I can't think of any major director at that time other than Dassin. Uh, I mean, maybe you could have got those guys that later came in the 70s because they were really changing the studio system. But at this point in 68, I can't think of anyone else who would have or could have done this as well as Dassin. It needed to be somebody who really had nothing to lose. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And he and uh, he he certainly did. But the the Roscoe Lee Brown character, I was fascinated by him, like I said, and clearly um, loathed himself and, and hated, you know, what what he was doing. But I think he just felt that this is what he had to do to survive. And so he uh, compromised himself. And in a way, he sort of is, well, not sort of, he is nudging uh, Tank to inform because he shows him those photos they have of him with mm. a, in a police riot and he's got a gun in his hand and it's uh, he's ba you know it's basically blackmail i mean he's only suggested it but he's like yeah look at this picture i have in the file here and in a way he was nudging him i mean he was blackmailing him so he's basically saying well i'll i'll get rid of these photos uh if you if you do this if you go and and rat on johnny but i don't think it was that simple because at the same time he felt betrayed by the group um, by Johnny, then he's being, you know, he's an outcast from the, the revolutionaries. He's desperate for money. And in that last scene at the end with Ruby D, I thought, and he, there he is in this hotel room and he knows he's going to be killed. He's gotten away from them once they find out it's him, but yeah. inevitably they're going to catch up to him. And he says to her, I don't know why I did it, you know? So I was curious what, what you thought. Did you... Did you see that as a simple motive or did you think it was sort of a combination of things? No, uh, to me, it was definitely more simple because, I mean, again, just to some of the points I made earlier about how this film really opened up sort of the story of being able to tell, you know, stories of the Black experience, hmm. which in many ways this is. And I mean, again, it doesn't have to be convoluted or politically driven or really you know intricate it can be simple and i mean yeah. that's what happens usually mostly in day-to-day -day life you know the ugly truths of, of of life in general can be quite simple and i mean i think that's really got what got highlighted quite well here well i love the fact that she you know when he tells her what he did she first you know hits him and scratches his face he's got the blood on his face and i can understand why she responded that way but as he opens up to her and he's so vulnerable and then she says uh she says i love you and their relationship is it's not clear because we see them earlier it's like he was sort of a boyfriend but not ex i guess because of his troubles she could only get so close um but there was clearly a history a a relationship there and the fact that when he goes out and he sees those two guys coming, and I love the music he used. He's like got this oh, rock yeah. song. Like it doesn't seem like your typical about to get killed music, but it just works so well. And he's like waving to them. I mean, again, it was just like, I, it was it was as if he felt he deserved to die uh, or maybe he didn't want to live anymore just because his problems ran ran so deep. Um Again, it's the it's the it's the it's the film noir element of this film, the doom protagonist. But but he does something interesting because as he climbs up and he's holding on to 
looks like this bridge and then he lets yeah. go and they cut back to that shot of after Johnny gets killed and it's spiraling. Yeah. Uh, the camera is spinning. And I thought that was such an interesting choice. I wondered what you, why you felt Dasson may have done that. Or what uh, you took from to, that. To me, it was just to kind of reiterate the sadness and the chaos. That's what I thought. Yeah. Of the moment, yeah. you know. That's what I thought. Just a spinning out of control. You know, it's just it's it's getting out of control, out of control, and in the end, there's no there's there's no solution. You know, and it's I mean, not I like that's what you know got from from that that's that final scene with Ruby, just because I mean, again, it starts with anger, but it, it descends so honestly into just pure sadness. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I also love that funhouse scene, and I know they talked about Christina Newland and. They talk about that because it's such an interesting scene where like they're, they're in the fun of the mirrors of their faces are melted. And she she pointed out that it looks like those cartoons, those racist cartoons that they used to make uh, uh, about black people. And 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 he's sort of talking that way as well. And so, again, I just saw saw that as this like communication, like the white the white people who are talking to the black people about what's going on and they they just think they're going to get shot <laughs> of course <laughs> they're just scared and it's such a unique scene because i just saw this visually saying this communication is as distorted as as anything gets and i, I, well, I was I mean, wondering it, what you took from that it's something dasin did has done did so well in so many of his films it's sort of that distorted reality of desperation and kind of giving us that that taste of it like the funhouse scene to me really sort of encapsulated that as as much as we're in this situation with these characters who think they know what's going to happen no they have no idea what's going to happen because it's life nobody knows right you know what i mean it's just one of those things where right your reality and my reality are going to be two different things exactly yeah exactly Exactly. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, such an extraordinary scene. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to mention on this on the movie? I mean, just as a reminder, I mean, to people out there listening, I mean, as much as we're we're talking and gushing about it, I mean, this movie made no money. Right. Nobody no one saw, saw it back in yeah. 1968. <laughs> it was, you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. it's one of those things where at least for me, it reminds me of the power of, and I mean, again, I'm speaking in broad terms here, but just looking back and being able to see films of an era and how they spoke to an era and how they can relate to things that are going on now and vice versa. It's such a a vital art form that I often find, and I mean, I know you're in the same boat as me, that never quite gets the due that it's deserved. It's not just entertainment stuff like this is very much art oh because i, I mean totally agree makes uptight yeah sort of with the thought of investment and money and return and foreign sales or all that kind of stuff this is such an example of what cinema as art can be i completely agree and to me this is one of the first of the hollywood new wave films i mean we think of easy rider bonnie and clyde I don't know why this this just for some reason you know um, went unnoticed. I mean, they they Daniel Kremer on this featurette he even shows how he first saw it. It was like a terrible VHS that yeah. was taped off a TV in the eighties, and the funhouse scene apparently was deleted uh, <laughs> from it. And I just thought, wow, to think that you know, there wasn't a, even a very good print of this until recently. Uh, but at least we have it now uh, uh, to treasure because I think it's, uh, again, I think it's a remarkable film. So, and I mean, so you know, the people who, who ultimately saw this in theater back in 1968, it's the guys like Brian De Palma. It's the guys like George yeah. Lucas, it's Marty Scorsese. Those are the people who saw this film. So, I yeah. mean, if anything... I'm thankful that it just exists because it, we had a sort of a master of cinema who made all these iconic 
I mean, let's face it, film noir was a was a was a was a B genre in terms right. of entertainment back then. But I mean, right. it was still so stylized and so beautiful and really telling these these gritty human stories to be able to apply it to the African American experience, sort of that like in this sort of firebed moment that was uh, the Martin Luther King assassination and how everyone felt. I really did get a sense of not just I don't want to say rage because that feels too easy but it was almost sort of desperation if mm, that makes yes. any kind of sense sort of the the desperation and frustration for being a black person in America oh absolutely uh, I I couldn't agree more so highly recommend uh there we go it's not blurry <laughs> highly recommend picking this up from imprint films i'll leave the link in the description box below for where you can get it from them and thank you imprint for sending uh, both dave and i a copy because i know dave's got got one as well uh what's uh what are you working on uh, these days dave anything you want to plug and share with us well as always our uh our podcast in the seats with where i sit down with a wide ranging variety of entertainment industry professionals is is chugging along we just published episode 560 i believe which is staggering wow. even to myself, but <laughs> <laughs> it's just, again, it's just, we're in the middle of the summer season, but all, you know, and I mean, it's obviously, you know, going to see the big stuff, but being able to sort of unearth some of the smaller and more interesting stuff that's going on at the same time, there's a lot of great cinema out there for, for anyone who just wants to go to the movies. There's, there's, there's really a lot to see right now. And it's important that you go support it because I mean, again, it's, it's such a vital art form that, I mean, we cannot stress that enough that the th nothing really does beat the theatrical experience. Absolutely. I, to I totally agree. And where can people follow you on social media and check out your podcast? Well, uh, for the podcast in the seats with, we're on all major providers, places like Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google. And plus we archive all of our episodes over at our in the seats YouTube channel. So obviously give us a like and subscribe wherever you can, but also on the socials on the facebook the twitter the instagram and god knows what else it feels like there's a new social media app every day these days but we're <laughs> at in the seats for all sorts of fun updates but if you want to come visit the site ourselves we're over at in the seats.ca where we talk about basically everything under the sun that is the moving image so please come on by fantastic and i will leave the links in the description box below for where you can follow dave and i highly recommend checking out his great podcast dave Thanks so much again for doing this. Uh, I know you're going to be back soon because we got another one lined up. So uh... <laughs> Absolutely. More the merrier. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I want to thank all of my members on Patreon. If you're interested in becoming a member of my Patreon, head over to the link patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies for full details. You can also leave a donation directly to my YouTube channel by pressing the thanks link, which you will find directly below the video frame, right beside the like and dislike links below. Click on the thanks link, and from there, you can leave a donation if you choose to. And lastly, if this is your first time here on my YouTube channel, please consider subscribing. It is absolute, absolutely free to do so by pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the Movies logo. You will see it floating above my head in the top left corner to your top left. In just a second, just click on that. And then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new episodes. Thank you so much, everyone. I will see you in the next episode.